editing faith here and we're just about to get into this mystery science theater gizmoplex reaction but first i'm going to read off this incredible list of the amazing twitch donators that we've had over for the St. Jude Children Hospital streams over this past month. We still have one quick stream this Saturday, December 4th, I believe is the day that is. Uh, no donations are necessary, it's just a fun time. We've been having a great time over there. I need to read off the incredible names. They're going to be getting credits through the end of this year, as well as on every review that they have donated for as well. So this is a huge thank you to Rogue2, Tommy Gun Servo, Techno Dan, Nightwing, Frank, Rich, Mist Explorer, Cur Cur Mist, excuse me, Curator of Entropy, Adam, Guido, Ble Bleach Black Cat, Ryan, Roy, Jackie Ball, uh, Dr. Donna42, City Forever on Twitch, there's also Charlie here on YouTube, Stuffy Wuff, uh, Kevin Nata, Servo1991, Angry American, and Roland. You guys, I hope I gave decent names between Twitch and real names and all that for you guys. Between these guys, in three all-day streams, three 12-hour streams on Twitch, we have raised over $2,100 for St. Jude's Children's Hospital. Last year on YouTube over here, we made $500. We've over quadrupled. It has been such an incredible blessing. You guys, like anytime anyone of you supports me, even just being here, it's insane. But the fact that I was like, I want to do charity again. Let's see how we can do it. And like, we're like, we are making a difference, man. Like, this is a lot of money. We're hoping to reach 2500 by the end of this last stream, which I, you know, I was good with a thousand. I didn't even know if we would hit a thousand and we did it easily. It's just been insane. So between... Uh, the end of this year and well into 2023, we have a ton of reviews coming out here on YouTube that will be dedicated to these guys. They'll all be in the credits, and then whoever individually donated for that one will get their shoutouts and everything. Because we have, what, at least 10 reviews have been, have been bought through these guys. It's insane. The, they came out of the woodwork for St. Jude, for these children. And that's been our, our catchphrase over there, is for the children! So I wanted to make sure I gave them their proper shout out here, and they'll be getting them through the rest of uh, 2022, as well as on their reviews, but I had to get that out there. And uh, now, on to the video. Hello, I'm Faith, and welcome to Faith's Take, where I talk about anything and everything that I find interesting. And welcome to my reaction of Mystery Science Theater's Gizmoplex, uh, The Batwoman, which is episode uh, 225? I think is what that says, which also makes it 1308. So, uh, I know I've been gone a while. At this point, you might have seen my reaction to Joel's episode pretty recently, but I have not recorded that since, like, July. After Joel's episode and after the Gamera episode, it's, like, it's it's getting boring. Um, I, I wasn't particularly avoiding these previous two episodes of The Batwoman and Million Eyes of Sumeru, but... Um, it's, they weren't a priority compared to other things. Like, I legitimately forgot about Batwoman, first of all, because I was, I think, out of town when that happened. I believe that's the one that they released the same weekend as Rift Tracks' last live show, I think, and I was out of town for that. And I didn't mean to wait so long, but the next one came out pretty quick, and I was like, great, I'll, I'll just do those the same night. And then it just kept being pushed back, and then there'd be nights where I finally could do it, and I'd be like, I don't really feel like watching those tonight. Um, and I've heard mixed things about these two episodes, which is interesting. I've heard some people that are like, no, I really liked it. Batwoman's really good. Excuse me. And then I've also heard people on my Twitch saying, you're not missing much by missing these two episodes. So I've, I've heard very mixed things, which is interesting. Because 90% of the time, I would say, I hear very positive things. And then people are like, why didn't you like it? And I was like, I'm sorry. I don't do it on purpose. So... I figured I need to get back on it because we have another new episode coming out in like a few days right now. It's like Sunday night and Friday we have a new episode again. So tonight I'll be doing the Batwoman and then it'll be a future video for you guys. But also tonight I'm going to try to do Sumeru as well. Uh, so we'll have, so tonight I have the, an Emily episode with Batwoman and then Jonah with, with Million Eyes. And it'll be interesting to say the least, like how this goes. Um... Not super impressed with the last few episodes or shorts. Uh, I know, for instance, like with Joel's episode, first half is, is pretty good and then it falls off. And then Gamera, it, yeah, it does it absolutely 
like, I wasn't looking for it to be on the same level as Joel's Gamera episodes, absolutely not, but it, like, pales so heavily in comparison to them. Even compared to, like, Yongari, I think, you know, I haven't seen that episode in a while, but I remember coming out with a better impression of that episode compared to the Gamera one that they, they did here. So, so far, the only episode to this day that I would feel 100% confident telling any mystery science fan to buy with their own money would be Munchie. The others, I would say, if you want the whole story, absolutely. If you're a completionist, absolutely. If you want to give it a chance yourself, which I encourage, 100% absolutely at least rent them to see what they're about. Um, but the only one that, like, if, if you erase the, this library, the only one I would go back and buy would be would be Munchie at this point. Um, but I'm hoping that changes. I really am. And we'll see how that goes. Um, especially because they're trying to do some plot things. Like, you had the stuff with Joel. And then I believe in the last one, it's when suddenly Emily, or not Emily, Kinga went from being like, you know, again, Grandma, I love you, I do anything for you, to like, Grandma, I hate you, leave me alone, to like, oh my gosh, my grandma and I are gonna go on a trip, and I'm like, okay, which is it? <laughs> like, I just, I wish it was just a little bit more consistent, or at least funnier. At least if it was funny, then I, then I could laugh at the inconsistencies as well, but it's just out of nowhere. So we're gonna head in to the Batwoman. The only other Batwoman thing I've ever seen is the wild, wild world of Batwoman from season five, I believe, of Mystery Science. Season 5, episode 15. That was a very early one then for for Monsieur Nelson. I don't know what to expect. Like I said, I've actually heard very mixed things about this one in particular. Where some people are like, I really enjoyed it. And others have been like, you're not missing much. Um, th this one has seemed to be a little more divisive. So we'll see how it is in general. Yeah, so we're just going to go ahead and, and move right on into uh, episode 1308. <laughs> I think that's correct. The Batwoman. Oh, no, wait, I meant to read it. <laughs> Hang on. Uh, in the theater, Emily's crew watches a Mexican film, which I think the first one is too, about a scantily clad superhero going up against a mad scientist trying to create a fish man in The Batwoman from 1968. Meanwhile, on the moon, Kinga and Pearl take a trip through time, leaving Max and the clones in charge of the experiment. Okay, like, you guys know, like, I want to like these mads. I do, like, that's the thing. I feel like if you just let them work, these two could be really funny, but they don't. And they're not giving them good scripts. I'm just like, I know these people could do it and you're just not letting them. So I'm, I'm not, I'm not looking forward to, to that. Also, I'm like, to this day, I'm salty because I'm like, okay, you have Patton also playing a villain and you don't do a single effing word girl reference, like nothing, nothing at all. Because the best character in word girl, like your best villain at least, is like, there's such good... Just foil and you don't use it! <laughs> I'm half gumball, half slinky. I know. You <clears throat> okay. Also, question. Why is her Tom's voice back to normal? Uh, because I thought about this and I'm pretty damn sure, and do correct me if I'm wrong, because it's been a while since I've seen Joel's episode, but I'm pretty sure halfway through he changes it to Josh. Again, very unfair to Connor in my opinion. But regardless, that you you change it to Josh's, and I'm pretty damn sure he didn't change it back before he left, or before the bots were taken back to to Emily. So why is his voice now back? Unless Emily fixed it herself, which again isn't unheard of. But I'm just saying, if you add these cha especially changes that are clearly done for like fan service reasons and not like actual plot reasons that make sense. Please explain when it changes back, or make a joke of it changing back. Maybe? Maybe just do that? I just don't understand it. Well, this says that I'm 2% bot! Oh, yeah. Does that mean Jonah can actually be bot? <laughs> like, like it said in, the, in that one? Does, does that mean that Jonah actually could actually be a robot? Which would explain why he's perfect? <laughs> oh my gosh, this looks like it'll be a, a fun one, huh, folks? Why is it only confusing that there's two gypsies? Even in the theme, it's like, which one? And I'm like, why? There's two of all of them! The boss decided I had enough robo ancestry to throw me a bot mitzvah. Oh my gosh. It comes from the book called Duke Robotomy. His name's an anagram for and no career. <laughs> Wait a minute. We've seen that name before. Hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. 
I knew it! He did the Santa Claus movies. I knew I knew this name. I was like, wait a minute. It is this one. Oh my gosh. No! <laughs> Ooh, 10 out of 10. This should be fun. How's it going, Agent Robles? Did you bring me good news? We're pregnant. Yes, Inspector. <laughs> According to our previous talk, I communicated with the While I didn't that think that was particularly funny, I am glad they did an in-theater the laugh. They don't do many of those anymore, because they're not actually in a theater. Gifted with a set of uncommon abilities, she was able to master all kinds of things. so funny. Just the cowl. She's a master of circle murder. I like that she doesn't even match the shirt color or anything. Just a completely different outfit. Using a mask and the alias... She became an amazing wrestler. Oh my gosh. What? I think amazing was a mistranslation. Y yeah. Oh my gosh. Kids, is this the baggage claim? She even has to land quirky. Man, it under arrest for crushing a child's birthday party. So she lands there. The not, not in her whole wrestling outfit. That thing. In a bikini on the beach on a with a parachute. This woman is the Sorry, definition of. We should have warned you about the hot vinyl seats. Yeah, right. This woman is the definition of extra. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Like, let me just let me just get on the steps here. Imagine if Batman just walked around nothing but a speedo. What's your position on Results from the autopsy. Yeah, I want to be next to a dead body in nothing but my underwear. Batwoman thought this was going to be a casual autopsy. <laughs> also, that would just... As you can see, there appears to be a <laughs> everyone would, like, between that and her being a wrestler, everyone's gonna know what her body looks like, so everyone's gonna be like, look for a woman with this body type, exactly. Hmm. I just... <laughs> hmm. I'm so confused. There's nothing practical about this outfit. Or another murder. Oh, she's good. Is it Reptilicus? What? <laughs> ah, that's funny. That's nice. It's Spanish. That was that was that was a good touch. <laughs> uh, full points. Full points for that. That was fun. That was fun. Meanwhile, uh, that just makes it confusing as to why I didn't give give this episode to Jonah and his bots. But that was fun, and it being in Spanish was a real good. That was a real good touch, and a way to just real quick. That was a real good touch. It was gonna be funny regardless, but that was a nice touch to make it more personal to this specific episode, this movie. That that was nice. That was nice. <laughs> and now the hard part: explaining where the money went to all his Kickstarter backers. Mm. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> no, that, that was a nice little meta joke there, I'll take it. <laughs> You're out of your element, Donnie. That guy just looks permanently furrowed and sad. Yes, of course. At the Stretch Armstrong Training Academy. Why is half the people why are half the people we've seen so far just like all basically naked? This is very weird. So she wears more clothes for this. Then the guys are basically naked now. Now she's in full clothing, so is her partner. Compared to what she went to see an autopsy. Ballet buddies. Yeah, yeah, I was about to say they're dressed for dance class. Why would you take the cowl off? The door was still open, madam. Private Coldstone. Let's hope it stays that way. But I really doubt it. Let's keep in touch. Yes, keep in touch. Delete contact. Pull the really good. Ping pong balls. You're already doing so much. Okay, I was about to say you're doing so much like fan service already, girl. What? Is, I don't understand what her style is. Change your life. It's like a sleeveless turtleneck and then suspenders. I literally, I don't understand Batwoman's style at all. Doordash, lobster roll. How did he not hear that? I feel like if three people came out of the water, you'd hear it. <laughs> and then he smiles. <laughs> Was that a uh, last five years reference? Okay, so, so far, we've had... Most of the riffs are pretty standard for this season so far. Now, we've had a couple really good ones, though, that did stay out. Like that Reptilicus reference with it in Spanish. Delicious. Really, really good. Uh, if that was actually a last five years reference, also really good and kind of niche, which I'm like, yes, let's go. Um, that was really good. I love musical references as well. Um, 
But one thing that I think is helping this one so far over the other, a lot of the other episodes, especially like the Emily one so far, is the movie and the way it's being delivered to us is already pretty ridiculous. Like, again, even just the way Batwoman dresses, I am so confused of like when it's time to wear a bikini, her whole outfit, or a sleeveless turtleneck and suspenders. Like, it's very bizarre. So it's like, just so far, the film, I think, is definitely goofy enough um, compared to some of the other ones where it takes a while to get goofy or it's just been kind of boring. I, I feel like this one has been has been goofy enough so far to keep your attention a little bit more than some of the others. Um, as well as, while again, most of the riffs have been pretty standard for the season, there have been a couple hits so far. So it's... I, I would definitely, so far, say this over Beyond Atlantis for sure, at least based on this first section. Welcome to the simulator of pain, Emily. No one's been tied up like that yet. I wonder if this was put in the wrong place. Also, I think... Also, I'm pretty sure uh, this is the first one that Kelsey did crow all herself. From what I heard, this is the first time where she is fully in control of the mouth. She's not dubbing something else. She's doing all the, the face movements, I think. <laughs> See, and that was good. That was good. That's a nice, like, little visual gag. Oh, that's weird. I don't. I don't know. Some of that picture makes me feel like that's just weird. With the, I think it's. I think it's because they gave it her hair. I don't like it. I think it was just the dog head. It'd be less weird. Oh, half human, half panda. Red, red panda. Oh. We're flexible. Yeah. Red and you got a deal? Ah. Yes. Oh, <laughs> that, you know, again, not a kind of like belly laughs or anything in that one. Pretty standard, but I like the visual gag with the rope. That first one where she stretched was funny. This is where oh, we found the crap. Dylan, it's your first day as a camera operator on set. You're already messing up. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what who he was supposed to be for a second. I was like, what is the camera? That's good. I tried to board his yacht, but they wouldn't allow me to step even one foot on it. I will miss you Well, I wouldn't either if a random lady just came up to my boat. I'd be like, please leave me alone. Mario, <laughs> Whoa, she Why would you fast? Yeah. yeah that's Why would you have the cape guys. on? I did not know that. Like, wouldn't it be harder to swim with the cape on? Like, wouldn't this be a time where you would just want to be in the bikini alone? The city of Acapulco is full of good people, ready to believe in good. <laughs> to believe in just about anything, really. One singular sensation. Every little, <laughs> little step, step she takes. She takes. <laughs> Granada Gym. And watch out for snakes. Do you want to ride? Oh, thank you. Yeah, why did they have to say that out loud? It's just the gym. <laughs> you didn't need to read that. That's funny. So far, still about the same, where it's like the riffs are like same as most of the season, but they've had a few really strong ones, and the movie's goofy enough to carry it, I think. When you're a billionaire, you have two choices. Fight crime or go to space. And last time I checked... <laughs> Oh yeah, she's by the sea, so Batwoman finally has her powers back. Isn't that weird? Like I this. <laughs> Good. I like when I like when any of them can do the the high kiva or Jim Kata and put like a spin on it. Those are fun. Finish him. I just hope that the next victims don't end up being either of us. Was that a threat? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like oh, I'm maybe you'll be the next victim. That'll surely give us the pressure that we need now. Have the reactors charged the like radiation drink, drink, unit? Drink, they are attacking the A <laughs> lot of work for pizza bagels. Soon may Reptilicus come to bring me fishmen tea and rum. <laughs> nice. Well, hello! Welcome One to the day when the something day is spa. done, we'll take I'm or George, leave and go. And this is my assistant, Reuben. She will be your mate. Uh, double <laughs> The destiny I have. Kelp, I need somebody. Oh, please, no, please. No. <laughs> I get by with a little kelp from my friend. <laughs> Sorry, I can't kelp myself. <sighs> the moss is taking a liking to that tree. <laughs> You're a witch. Huh. Leave me alone. I said I didn't want to be in your stupid film. Stop <laughs> following me. I didn't sign a release. You'll hear from my lawyers. 
Move, fish, get out the way, get out the way, Jeez. get out the way. Dude. I'll be in my mega bat cave. Why did none of their mads like work? <laughs> Idiot, she is. Why are none of these mads funny, guys? I'm so tired of them. They're just boring. Fly me to the moon. <laughs> And where you only see one set of footprints, that's when the fishman was carrying you. <laughs> if only there were a wrestler here. <laughs> like the one you are seeing now, which I've given the special name PC. It's short for Reese's Pieces Esquire. We I hate people who pronounce it like that. Buy a lottery ticket. And Reese's Pieces, oh, like it's Reese's Pieces. Pieces isn't even a word. Thug life. It'll be interesting to see if a woman can survive. That was good. Toy boat, toy boat. Toy yep, boat. toy boat. <laughs> oh, there's a mouse right there. Get it out of here, please. Get it out of here. Come on, boy. Uh, yes. uh, wow, they're really gonna end on that. Away. Uh, bats terrible. Okay, okay, seriously, quit it. <laughs> Bat chance. <laughs> wow, so they really ended on that to be like, hey, strong, smart female lead. Wow. She's a bat. She should have just eaten it. <laughs> That's not what we're. Oh great, the other Mads is back. <laughs> so, did... So, okay. Everything was fine till just now. No, let my bots be okay! Bring Waverly and Growler back to safety. That doesn't make any sense though, because everything was completely fine being run by Cynthia until right then. He disappeared. Okay, I don't- I honestly am like, okay, that might have worked better if we had never seen the Mads till the- after the movie was sent. But we did, so we know it was okay, and I'm like, the, the jokes have to make sense! <laughs> just, okay, hang on. The ending also- this ending also undercut the episode, because I thought the point was, if you were going for the joke that Max is totally incompetent and terrible, then either you have to show that the whole time, or don't show the Mads again at all till the end, and then you're like, oh, okay, what would have happened? And that's fine. That's a funny one-episode joke to end on that could have worked. But if you're going to go back to the Mads, you know, to see, like, Cynthia and Mega Cynthia when it comes to, like, the Batwoman outfit sketch or whatever... Well, then it's like, now we kind of do need an answer to how that happened because everything seemed to be completely under control for the first, like, hour. So that's what I'm confused about. Very undercutting, just like that mouse gag. So this episode, to me, um, it it did a very similar thing. I had a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot less to say in the second half, if you might have noticed. Because, like, everything stopped happening. Almost all the best jokes were in the first half. Um, and then it just slowed down, and it's a lot of jokes. Like, it's not their fault the movie sets them up for a lot of fish jokes, but they're all fish jokes we've heard before from these very people. It's like, it, it, a lot like in Joel's episode, it's like all of a sudden a lot of the good jokes kind of just came to a halt. Um, and even the movie itself kind of stopped being as fun in a goofy way and just became like, oh, well now there's a fish man after her, and I don't know why that was less fun than in the first half. It's like the whole thing ended up kind of falling a little flat. Again, the first half, I'm like, okay, you know, there was a good uh, visual gag in the first mid-movie host segment, and there were a few really good riffs. Again, that Reptilicus, Every Country's a Monster in Spanish riff, top notch. That was a top notch joke, especially for this season. Very, very good. Very well done. And again, there were good points in it, good good sections in it for sure, but it's like once we hit that middle host segment, it was just kind of sta super standard from there for the rest of how this season has been. And again, if you're enjoying this season, that's great. Then you'll enjoy this episode, absolutely. But it's like I got a couple good laughs out of the first half, but I don't think it's enough to justify watching it again. The only thing I would do is get to that Reptilicus part and then I could shut it off, uh, I feel like. One thing, too, that really stands out, unfortunately, and this is not just to Kelsey, but just in general, is when they make Kelsey do a voice 
Crow's voice completely goes away. She is no longer doing a Crow doing a voice. It's just Kelsey doing a voice. Where Trace could do Crow doing a voice. He was very good at that. And and I get it. Like, if you have her having to do a woman's voice as Crow, it's just gonna sound like a woman. But it just sounds like a different person, you know what I mean? Or it just sounds like her doing her own voice completely. Like, she's not even in a character as much anymore. Um, which, again, is just a weird choice for me, then, to have an adult woman playing Crow the way that she is, and then giving her these lines with these inflections is a little weird to me. And speaking of inflections, it just, the, they are so interchangeable. These performers are so interchangeable at this point. Um, they, it, I don't know if they've trained them or if they just had these new guys watch the first two seasons a lot because, like, just the way they read their lines is exactly the same. I feel like if you put a script in front of me and we're like, Faith, read these riffs the way that the season 11 and, and through now Cruz would read them, I could do it because they all read the lines almost identically. N almost none of the time do any of them really have a super clear voice. And the thing is, in season 11, you start to kind of get a feel for some of their voices, I feel like you do. But now it's like everything's written the same and everyone reads it the same and there's very, very little of, of people really getting to stand out. And then it'll kind of seem like they're letting someone do it and then they kind of take it away again. And I'm just like, because like for a little bit it kind of seemed like, hey, Kelsey reads puns really well. Maybe that should be her thing. Kind of like how they're usually Kevin's thing or Kevin Tom Kevin's Tom's thing. You know, Time Chasers is a good example of that. So I'm like, maybe for them now, you can give Kelsey the puns, but they didn't just give her the puns. So she doesn't have that thing, and they're not really giving anyone a clear thing. Um, the only thing is when they want a really extreme speed or voice thing done for some reason, like they want the voice to go really, really high or really, really fast, they give it to Baron, and I don't think he can deliver on those. Um, not that he was in this episode, but it's like, I'm just saying, like, when they're trying to give someone something, like, talk really, really fast or go really, really squeaky and high, they give it to him and it just, it honestly, just comes off as irritating. And I don't blame him, I just think that's not how he can best deliver those jokes, but that's how they give them to him. And, and that's the thing, is they've all become nearly indistinguishable from each other. Um, I think they still give Tom a little more of the singing, just to stay true to his original character, which which I can appreciate. Um, but otherwise, and the thing is, again, they, they all read it the same. They make every single one of them have the same inflections for everything. That was never Mystery Science. You pick any episode of the original Mystery Science, even back to KTMA, and they all have a very distinct style, a very distinct way of riffing, and if you gave them all the same line, they would all read it differently. You know, it, it's just that's just always how it's been. Same thing with Rift Tracks, whether we're talking the main trio, Bridget Mary Joe, Sean and Connor have gotten a lot more lately, which is great, but they all read differently. They all have their own voice and they're like, they're not letting these guys have that. Again, I think there's moments in, in like season 11 where they get their own voices a little bit more as they get more comfortable, but now it's like cookie cutter. Everyone is the same. And it just, it, it just, it keeps getting more and more like that, and especially when the jokes aren't hitting that much, or they're just kind of boring, or just kind of existing to fill space, then it comes off really badly, because we can't just be like, oh, that was a good read, because it was a funny riff. And then it just becomes like, okay, that was a read that literally any of you could have done. And that's what sucks to me, is I, I feel like th there is no, okay, this is the large personality bombastic singing one like Tom and this is like the really, you know, snarky, easily angered like Bill's Crow and Trace's Crow, totally different where Bill's is like gets really easily angered and he can deliver, to this day, Bill delivers the angry riffs, absolute cream of the crop, A plus levels, right? Um, and, and even just the way that, you know, Joel is the very, very dry, deadpan, sleepy-eyed guy it's just everyone has their different reads to it. And for some reason with these two trios, they just either don't let them or don't have them do it. Um, and like we, we've we discussed before, they just wrote all these episodes as in you can give them to anybody and it wouldn't really matter. They could read them in any order, which is, is really weird to me. Um, and I understand that they don't write in terms of thinking, 
like, oh, this is a good line for this boss specifically. Like, they're not trying to specifically think of, like, a line for Tom Servo, a line for Emily, a line for Crow. I know they don't write it that way. But when you are, you know, I don't know, like, do they have a head writer? Do the credits give a head writer credit? Hang on. So I just double checked uh, so I wouldn't have egg on my face. I was wrong. They don't have a head writer. They don't have a head writer. And the thing about that, from what I gathered, is the head writer in the original show was Mike. And one of his, his the big things that he did was organize the script. Like, have, like, okay, this is the timestamp, and we're giving this line to Joel, Crow, Tom, whatever. And if they don't have anyone doing that, if they just randomly, I don't know if they randomly assign them, or if someone does go through and is like, okay, this will be Tom, this will be Crow, this will be Emily, whatever then they don't do a great job at it and letting them kind of have individual stuff. And then if they don't, that's also bad because I'm like, well, then let them have individual stuff. Um, while I, as I said, they were good riffs and it wasn't terrible. I think Beyond Atlantis is probably even more boring because there's like nothing fun in that movie really at all. Uh, and at least Batwoman has her ridiculous fashion choices. <laughs> at least there's a little something in it to, to enjoy in the movie on its own with how goofy it is. You know, or like, you know, the narrator having to read every sign in English when there's nothing else being narrated. That's a funny little goofy, stupid thing in the movie. Uh, it's by the same guy that did Santa Claus. So, you know, it's going to have a little bit of that stupid, quirky weirdness that his other stuff does. Which, which Beyond Atlantis does not have. But that's about it. Other than that one good visual gag with the rope joke, nothing in the host segments really stuck out. Um... Again, unless they're letting it be that Joan is actually a robot after all because of her, her bot mitzvah. And that pun was was funny. But otherwise, again, it's like, this is all these mads are terrible. All these mads are terrible. I don't know. Again, though, they're all kind of written the same way. G okay, I'm sorry. The Cynthia and Mega Cynthia bits, just swap it out and make it King and Max. It's the same effing bit it's the same effing jokes it's the same effing delivery it's all the same and one of the greatest things in mystery science theater especially if you're like me and you're a nut about characters and how characters work it's like all the dynamics are different all the personalities are unique and different and you're not letting them have that not any of them not the bots and the the, the humans at this point they've all kind of become the same person and one of the reasons like Everyone knows I'm such a simp for, for Jonah Heston. But this season, you know, it's like they're they're all kind of just weak and just kind of there. And there's not a lot. Or they'll give him like a little bit. And I'm like, there it is. And then it goes away. But in like season 11, he had enough stuff between both host segments and riffs that were character building. And showed a lot about him and his personality that aren't really there anymore. And... Again, same thing with Emily, and I don't blame Emily uh, herself, like, in real life, Emily at all, because, again, I, they're just not giving her anything to work with. Like, Jonah, the first thing you see is him saving, trying to save the lives of strangers. That's gonna leave an impact, at least to me, that leaves a huge impact. But Emily doesn't get anything like that, and then, I'm not saying she has to even have something that grandiose, but she, she's never given a defining character moment like that, that Jonah has. Um... You know, I, I think that even Mike, in his first couple episodes, has defining moments. When a new riffer comes in, they tried really hard to give them unique, defining character moments. So you would like them. And I think with Mike and with Jonah, it worked really well, but Emily hasn't really had that. And she's fine. She's pleasant enough. She's not, like, annoying necessarily or anything like that. But she doesn't have anything that's really won me over. And same thing definitely with, with Kelsey's crow. Really with these bots in general, though. Like, Connor's servo doesn't stand out because he is a carbon copy of Baron's. Like, he reads it exactly the same. And maybe he was directed that way. Maybe that's just how he feels comfortable. Because that's what he did for the live shows. Again, if that was his choice, then fine. But I think it's a disservice to, like, his own comedic takes on things. If he's just doing exactly what Baron would do. And then with Kelsey... It's like, I, I don't know, now that she is able to do, because as far as I've been told by people on my Twitch streams, this was the first episode where Kelsey was fully doing the mouth movements herself and was not just dubbing someone, right? Like dubbing over someone else who'd done the performance. 
it didn't really make much of a difference in terms of the performance. It still, she was reading it the same way and it just does it. That voice does not work for me for Crow. It's like a, a 11 year old boy's voice and it does not work. Um, it, it sounds like it came from either a kid's cartoon or like a preschooler sh show. And I'm not d dissing those shows specifically, but I'm just saying it is not a voice that works for Crow T Robot, in my opinion. It doesn't have to match, you know, Trace and, and Bills. Not at all. But it does not work with Crow and his personality, or in this case, lack thereof, that they're really giving them. So yeah, it's like a couple good jokes that, I, again, I give them full credit for those jokes and that visual gag. Absolutely great. That's what made it stand out more to me than Beyond Atlantis, for sure. But it's like, I'm still not... Like, I keep looking for something to grasp that season 11 at least had in it, and there isn't anything. Um, and season 11 took a while to get its footing, for sure. I don't think they have a fully solid episode at all till Time Traveler, and really till Avalanche. I think Avalanche is the first good, like, fully good, I enjoyed it beginning to end episode of the newer series of it, newer seasons. But, like, it's just not happening. Like, at most, I'm like, okay, I've enjoyed up to half an episode. And then it's just, like, really boring. Or there's good jokes here and there throughout. But it's not enough for me to be like, I'm gonna sit down and watch this whole episode. Literally just one. Just one. And a lot of it is due to how just absolutely cuckoo nuts bananas the film is with, with Munchie. And that was the one where... Jonah felt more individual again because of how much he hated it and how he was like, no, no, I'm not going in that theater. Like, thank you for giving him another moment of, like, full personality that is his. Like, that was Jonah being able to come back out. And I think that Jonah definitely is still stronger of a character than Emily by a lot. Not just because I like him, but I think that, that Jonah Heston is still given just enough, or Jonah himself, maybe it's, it's Jonah Ray himself, is able to pull enough... Um, out of, of the, the lines into his performance to make it work, even if the dialogue isn't strong, right? Even if the bit isn't a strong bit. Um, his trio is still stronger than Emily's, and again, I want to give them the time to breathe, for sure. Um, so I'm not just saying, oh, they're weaker, because they've, they've barely had anything. They've had very few episodes compared to them. But, again, in the theater, everyone's kind of the same. Everyone's kind of the same. And, and again, it's just, there's a few host segments, there's a little bit here where I'm just like, you know, Jonah still sticks out, and tiny little bits where I could see them trying to grasp at something. But I mean, even the Mads, you could have switched the whole thing with like, Mega Cynthia having the Batgirl outfit, I'm like, you could literally have made that, Kinga and Max, same joke, same delivery, literally nothing would have to change. And that's a problem for me, like, that these guys don't really get to have their indi individual moments and voices and riffs like they used to. Not saying every single line has to be written so just perfectly crafted for everybody, but you need to let them have something instead of just, okay, it's Batwoman, everyone just sounds the exact same, we could have given this to Jonah and crew and it would have sounded the same. It, you know, it just, it's just sad to me. Like, it's just disappointing for me. I know some people don't give a crap about it and they just want the riffs. Okay, but, but what are your feelings, like genuinely, what are your feelings on the fact that all these riffs sound the same? They're all almost given with the same cadence and delivery, you know? Because to me, that makes a lot of them less funny. There's some that could have been funnier with a better read and they're not. And then there's so many that just are there to fill space. Just there to fill space. So that's the thing. Yes, I harp a lot on characters and set design and stuff like that. But even when you just look at the riffs, it just is not as entertaining as it used to be. And I don't think it ever will be with this current, at least, crew of writers, if nothing else. Because a lot of them are the same. And a lot of them are literally just to fill space. You can tell that wasn't an inspired, really funny joke. That was a joke they had because like, oh, it's been 20 seconds, we have to say something. And that's the thing that sucks. It's like, whether you're in it for the whole package like me, or just the riffs, I don't think it's a very giving season. You know, I, I really don't think that it's coming up with as much as it, as it could and should. Um... You know, whether we're talking host segments, riffs, or anything in between, it just keeps falling flat. And I give it full props when there are moments, whether it's a whole scene, or a whole section, or a song, or whatever. 
I give them full props once there. Again, every country, every country has a monster in Spanish. Beautiful. That's going to be a mo one of my favorite moments of this season, guaranteed, because it was so well done and it was so well placed. And again, it being Spanish gave it its own little bit of like a niche and a voice based on this movie. Very good. But there's so few moments like that in this season. It, it, it is just disappointing because we've had good stuff and I know these guys... I know these guys could do better if they were given the chance, and they're just not. And it's, it's, that's, I think, the biggest tragedy is, like, I bet all these people could do so much better with a better crew of writers or with a better, just someone to tie it all up together in a nice bow that they clearly do not have. Um, so, you know, I'm sorry, this probably isn't what a lot of people want to hear, Again, to be just like, yeah, I didn't really like it. I'm saying kind of the same thing over and over in these episodes now. Um, so it's probably getting boring. But it just, there isn't much else to say. But I miss having distinct characters and riffing styles and voices and jokes and host segments that work. And Mads that are actually funny. You know, but uh, I will be, I'll take a little bit of a break. And then I'll be getting into Million Eyes of Sumeru and we'll see how that one compares as well. It's a Joan episode, so we'll see how much of what I've said in this episode still holds true in the next one, if anything. So as always, thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you guys later.